Luteinizing Hormone Day, yay, in our series of reproductive hormones. Super excited. Dr. Raquel, what is luteinizing hormone, also known as LH? What's it all about? Yeah, so this totally like nerds me out. I get so excited researching and talking about it, but it's really cool because you have this very tiny like pea-sized gland at the base of your brain and they call it like the master gland um, because it pumps out a lot of your hormones um, and so at the front of that um, pituitary gland um, it pumps out LH um, and so you have like an anterior pituitary and a posterior pituitary so the anterior part of that gland is what produces our LH and so what happens is LH is what triggers um, your ovulation um, and it also triggers the formation of your corpus luteum to continue to pro produce progesterone. So I know it's a, a, a lot, um, but the hormone is responsible for a very, very important part of your fertility cycle, and that's maintaining the uterus for pregnancy. Okay, great. So the corpus luteum from, you're saying the lining of the uterus. So, so or the, you mean the egg. <laughs> I'm already confused. It's, it's, Reproductive, like reproductive endocrinology is a beast. Okay? Yeah. Um, it's so many pieces, but how it works is that, so do you remember when you were going through your fertility cycle and he was doing your ultrasound or he or she was doing your ultrasound and they were looking at all of your follicles. So our ovaries contain a ton of little bitty follicles, right? And inside of these follicles are immature eggs. So these immature eggs have to develop and then you have a dominant follicle. So that dominant follicle kind of matures and that's when you have your LH surge. That dominant follicle is what is released to meet with um, sperm and that's when you create an embryo. Got it, okay. So yeah, that pituitary gland is so important. How do you maintain health of your pituitary gland? Cause I'm thinking through this and I'm going, okay, wait, but my egg quantity is definitely declining. I'm in my 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 forties. Don't want to tell you how old I'm turning here in a, in a couple months. It's a little nerve wracking. And, and you know, so, so my egg qual count is declining, which means that, that at some point I'm not going to have this LH surge anymore. Well, you're, well, you'll have your, your LH surge will always happen. It just will happen in a lower frequency. So that's what happens as we mature is that the, the sequence of hormones starts to decline a little bit. And so when that dominant follicle is released, it leaves behind a corpus luteum. And then that normally disintegrates to a corpus applicans. I'm telling you, it gets very... Okay, that's where I got confused. So what you're talking about is that when the dominant follicle is released, it leaves behind something that releases progesterone. The corpus luteum, yes. Yes, okay. And yes. then that progesterone, is that starts helping then the next phase of the cycle to ready your body for fertilization and implantation. Yes, yes. And you need, so um, a lot of people will ask about like what the trigger shot is doing. The trigger shot is literally um, imitating what LH does in your body. So when you Got have it. the LH surge, right. it's releasing that dominant follicle. Um, so it's right. a very important part. So you want that corpus luteum because it's also pushing out progesterone to make sure that it's supporting your pregnancy, supporting your uterine lining. So it's very, right. very important. So, then, so last time we talked about progesterone and we talked about how some people are low producers of pro progesterone. So when that dominant follicle is released, they, they don't have as much progesterone that's left behind, or is it the next mechanism of progesterone that they're not, they're not making the amount that, that they should be making to support the next phase of a pregnancy? Yes, yes, so true. And, and that's what's really cool about it is because let's say for instance, in that case, it would be women who have PCOS. So you have this, this steady sequence of hormones being produced, but with women with PCOS, they push out too much um, of um, the LH. And when you push out too much LH, it produces testosterone. So that's why women who have PCOS do not have normal periods because they're pushing out so much LH that it's producing um, testosterone and affecting their periods. Whereas if you produce so little LH, you don't ovulate. So you need that little, you need mm -hmm. that steady balance of it. So then that brings us to another really important point about women with PCOS and that LH test strips are inaccurate for them tracking ovulation. So they can still ovulate. Mm -hmm. It might be irregular. It might be all over the place. But from what I understand, 
if if they only measure LH, they're really getting inaccuracies when it comes to, to ovulation timing. Yeah, and you, you have to get the full picture. I know a lot of people say, you know, I was using the test strips where they never really work. And oftentimes it's because the test strips are based on a 28 day cycle. And some of us, that's not realistic. That's not our cycle. Mm -hmm. And so you have to make sure you're getting a full hormonal picture to see when am I ovulating? When is the best day to test? Right. And mm -hmm. because of that elevated LH, it, it's, it's not predictive of their releasing of an egg. They exactly. need a full picture of hormones. And so we, we have some partners, um, you know, Obusense is one of them. Mirror Fertility came on as nice. well. There's a couple of different ovulation kits that are um, clinically validated for those with PCOS. And I think that's such an important distinction to remember is that not every single type of tracking is is one size fits all. Exactly. We're, so, we're so different. So it's really important to understand all the different ones that are on the market, which is not this show, but it's just to tease it up because we yeah. will do a show about all the different ovulation trackers. We definitely yeah. will. <laughs> so, you know, I, so I kind of I kind of alluded to this a minute ago, but is there something that we can do to like really maintain the health of the pituitary gland? Or is it really just maintaining overall health and wellness? Does weight kind of make your pituitary gland sluggish? You know, are there things like diet and lifestyle that that quote unquote make it sluggish so that it doesn't, you know, do that thing where it's like masterful and, and getting that symphony started, if you will? Right. So unfortunately, it's hard to kind of influence things that our brain have control of. So like our pituitary gland, which is what I love about the human body. Even when I research about these things, it's like, wow, our bodies are brilliant. You know, sometimes things get in the way yeah. to kind of knock us off balance and affect the mm -hmm. way we are secreting hormones, but our bodies are very intelligent. And so that um, pituitary gland is really, really good at making sure you have what it needs, but it's what happens downstream um, that affects our health and our fertility. So even if your pituitary gland is pushing out the normal levels of LH, if you are overweight mm -hmm. or if you do suffer with PCOS, it's what happens downstream, you know, your brain sends out that signal. Okay. Now got what it. is your body doing to affect those levels? Okay. Got it. Yeah, oh, man. It gets over, it gets overwhelming. I mean, it it, it's overwhelming because it is such a symphony and it is such a harmony and it just feels like there's so many things that can go wrong. I know. I know. And so many it's things are so right. And so many things that can go right. And certainly when you see, you know, that, that, I mean, that's the struggle in, in the world of infertility is that we look around and we're like, wait, everybody else, it's so easy. Why, why is their body working? Maybe they make it seem easy and, and it's not yes. so easy, you know? And I, and I think that the, the, the deeper we dive into the science, uh, you know, the more that we realize that. So I think on this fertility tip Tuesday, then what we have to really pay attention to is the things that we can influence downstream, exactly. not things like our brain development is our brain development. It is where it is. If you're past the age of what, 26, 27, your frontal lobe is already done. You can't do anything about the pituitary <laughs> gland itself, but, um, but you can impact things that are, you know, downstream to, to impact or influence positively. Maybe your PCOS symptoms, maybe the level of impact of PCOS with diet and lifestyle changes. Mm -hmm. So is there any, what's on the top of that list that you can, that, you know, is coming to mind for you right now, Dr. Raquel of, you know, if there's just one change, we could encourage people who overproduce LH um, or have an LH issue where they're overproducing testosterone. What's one little change that they could make today that could make a difference. I always say this and I know people get so annoyed, but getting rid of those plastics, getting rid of things that are going to mm -hmm. knock your hormones off balance is such an easy and i don't want to say easy because it's expensive to get rid of plastic um but you want to make sure that you're getting rid of these um endocrine disruptors um because you want to make sure that your body um naturally is producing those good levels of estrogen and progesterone so um Got it. a good way to just get rid of that estrogen dominance is to get rid of some of the things that are influencing it um, Maybe we should push out a challenge right now. So is it is it better for me to get rid of my plastic toothbrush or my plastic baggies that I store food in? Plastic baggies. Yeah. Your okay. toothbrush is totally fine. Anything that could be potentially warmed up by heat. So sitting in your car or in your microwave or things like that. Those are things okay. you have to be careful of. But other things like some people okay. get the water bottles from Trader Joe's and things like that. That's totally fine. It's just anything that could be warmed up. Okay. All right. Yeah. I can commit to this. I accept yeah. the challenge. I'm not going to warm up any plastic in my microwave. I don't think I do now, except, except 
I'm just thinking through it. There is a microwavable mac and cheese that Dante really likes. And that is that comes in like a little plastic tin, but there's no reason I have to heat it up in their plastic tin. Exactly. I can, I can heat it up in a glass bowl and I have tons of those. Yeah. So challenge accepted. I'm no longer going to be heating up mac and cheese for my kid in that. And if you're somebody that's trying to have a six and a half year old that you're trying to just have that newborn, you're trying to conceive, look around. And if you're heating anything up in the microwave and plastic, will you accept this challenge as well? And just say no to just plastic this week. Just this Absolutely. week. Let's just take it one week at a time. All right. One that's awesome. I love that. I love that tip. All right. That's your fertility tip Tuesday. It's LH. We're still on this hormone um, series. I love it so much. Probably next week we should do estrogen, estradiol. Maybe. Absolutely. All right. So thanks so much, Dr. Raquel. And we'll see you guys next week on Fertility Bye. Tip Tuesday. Bye. <laughs>